Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. Tonight, Donald Trump heads home from the hospital. Cue the questions about his health, his treatment, and his message. You don't wait for perfect data to make urgent decisions. Ontario urged to crack down harder. BC shows how that can work. When you live alone, you know, when you, when you say a household, and you're, you're the household. Living single under COVID and under tighter rules. And something for Canadians to celebrate. We have a lot of work to do. In this, of all years, a Nobel Prize in medicine. This is The National. Well, it is a quiet scene tonight. The White House now with its president back inside. But what a dramatic moment upon his return just hours ago. Donald Trump, infected with the coronavirus, walked up the steps from the South Lawn, paused at the entrance, and then he took off his mask. For supporters, defiant. For others, reckless. Most definitely symbolic. Another wild moment in what has been a wild three days. So he was admitted just Friday with symptoms of an illness that has killed so many Americans, an illness he has downplayed. Tonight, home again. He seemed to be back on message. Paul Hunter now with what Trump and his doctors are saying. There he is, the president, mere days after going into hospital for COVID-19, tonight out of hospital, discharged and pumping that fist. Then came a short flight across the U.S. Capitol, and soon enough, stunningly, Donald Trump, still being treated for COVID-19, was back in the White House, removing his mask before stepping in the door. This afternoon, his doctors, criticized for seeming to downplay the seriousness of the president's illness, signed off on his return home. Though he may not entirely be out of the woods yet, the team and I agree that all our evaluations, and most importantly, his clinical status, support the president's safe return home. Keep in mind, despite that video yesterday of Trump doing a drive-by outside the hospital, waving to his supporters, and despite the images sent by the White House of Trump working while in hospital, it's been an extremely complicated period for him. At times running a fever, his oxygen levels at least twice dropping, doctors have been using multiple treatments. Now, not only home, but tonight himself seeming to downplay the pandemic, releasing a remarkable video that leaves no doubt of his view of a virus that's left more than 210,000 Americans dead. Don't be afraid of it, he says. And now I'm better, and maybe I'm immune, I don't know. But don't let it dominate your lives. Get out there, be careful. We have the best medicines in the world. It's a message some have called unconscionable. Even today, Trump's press secretary, Kayleigh McEnany, became the latest in Trump's inner circle to test positive. Just as Trump himself returns to the place, COVID has seemingly been spreading quickly. His lead doctor on this today called Trump's prognosis uncharted territory. If we can get through to Monday with him remaining the same or improving, better yet, uh, then we will all take that final deep sigh of relief. So he's in the White House tonight, Paul, but uh, clearly this is a changed White House. Uh, absolutely it is. Uh, for starters, no more Oval Office for the president, at least for now. Uh, he'll be restricted to working in the main part of the White House, basically just inside the door he walked into tonight. They've got temporary offices now set up on the ground floor out back, which, by the way, are close by to the White House medical offices, including that of Dr. Conley. This keeps Donald Trump out of the West Wing, uh, where there have been a handful of positive COVID tests this week, among other White House staffers. And by the way, uh, journalists will be affected by this as well. Uh, just outside that blue briefing room that you always see on TV are two floors of, you know, generally speaking, jam-packed workspaces. Uh, they're for White House journalists. Uh, that is now effectively empty. They'll all be working from home. It is, Adrian, a changed place indeed. All right, Paul Hunter at home in Washington. Thanks, Paul. So as Paul mentioned, today the number of COVID cases inside Trump's inner circle grew. White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany and reports say two assistant press secretaries have now tested positive. 
McEnany spoke with reporters just yesterday with no mask, but says none of the journalists spent enough time with her to be considered close contacts. McEnany was at this event in the White House Rose Garden just over a week ago with several other people who have since tested positive for COVID-19, though she says she has had other negative tests since then. Details of the president's health have been confusing and conflicting even from his doctors over the last few days. What we do know is that Trump is being treated with a whole range of medications. Christine Birak walks us through them. When a COVID-19 patient repeatedly requires oxygen, it's usually a bad sign. That really does suggest that the illness is preventing his lungs from being able to absorb oxygen, which is what this illness does, um, and that's a red flag. While it's not clear how severely ill the U.S. president is or was, he's now receiving a full range of tested and untested treatments. He's a high-risk patient on three drugs, you know, so this is a person who obviously they're worried about. One of those drugs isn't even approved for use. It's an experimental cocktail of antibodies. According to the drug company, its safety and efficacy have not been fully evaluated. A recent trial involving 275 non-hospitalized patients suggests the treatment is safe, appeared to reduce symptoms and levels of the virus. But experts note that data has not been peer-reviewed. My biggest concern would be for side effects that might not uh, yet have borne out from the smaller trial that they've done already. Trump has also been prescribed remdesivir. The antiviral treatment is supposed to block the virus from making copies of itself. In moderately ill COVID-19 patients, it has been found to reduce hospital stays. But Trump is also being given a drug usually reserved for severely ill patients called dexamethasone. The steroid can prevent the immune system from overreacting and attacking the body, which kills many COVID-19 patients. Dexamethasone can also have side effects including confusion. So, is it all too much? There's this bias in clinical medicine to be seen to be doing something, and sometimes that can be to patients' detriments. I think it awaits to be seen in this setting. Doctors say Trump's treatments will continue at home. The coming days may reveal whether they've helped or hindered him. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. So there's much more ahead on this story, including a chat with these two doctors, their reaction to Trump's decision to leave hospital and that tweet downplaying the seriousness of this deadly virus. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked today about his coronavirus testing history. Earlier in September, I had a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a throat tickle is probably the best way I could say it. So I checked with my doctor and he recommended I get tested. Uh, I got tested. Uh, it was negative. Trudeau says he then self-isolated for a few days before returning to work after being cleared by his doctor. It is the first time the Prime Minister has spoken publicly about being tested for the virus. But when it comes to the general public, testing capacity is not keeping up with demand, even as case counts climb. At a certain point, reinstating some community-based public health measures as we've observed in parts of Ontario and Quebec, is required to bring COVID-19 back down to manageable levels. Today, Quebec reported nearly 1,200 new cases. In a moment, we will show you the strict new measures that province will put in place to try to slow that spread. But we begin in Ontario, which has more than 600 new cases today. And as Katie Nicholson shows us, Ontario is reluctant to shut down the bars and restaurants where that spread seems to be happening. COVID testing, starting today by appointment only. Thing is, that message got a little garbled. I've been having like fever on and off today. Divya Vivekanda got sick after meeting up with friends. This morning, a Toronto hospital said she and about 75 others didn't need an appointment. But then... A couple of doctors came out and they were like, you all can go, we're not going to test you guys if you didn't have appointments. And we were like, we've been waiting in the cold for so long. She spent much of today trying to book an appointment, but testing and contact tracing are all so backlogged now, experts say it's all too late. We can't possibly be in touch with case contacts fast enough to uh, prevent them transmitting infection to other people. Instead, COVID hotspots like Toronto continue to push the province to allow it to close restaurants and bars. 
I can't make a willy-nilly decision and just say I'm, I'm closing everything down and ruin thousands and thousands of people's livelihoods. So show us the evidence, hardcore evidence. Toronto says it has. We provide and upload data to them in respect of all our cases every single day. This is how it works within the context of large outbreaks. The province really needs to get out of her way. Uh, it's, uh, this is going to look horrible in hindsight. A major study published last month found adults who tested positive for COVID were twice as likely to have reported dining at a restaurant. That's eating, drinking, singing, shouting. Sounds like a bar, doesn't it? Other places around the world have taken that to heart. Tomorrow, Paris begins a two-week closure of bars and cafes. New York is also ending indoor dining in some areas. Sick and awaiting a test appointment, Divya Vivekanda thinks it's a good idea. 2020 is cancelled anyway, so I'd rather just stay home and stay alive. <laughs> Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. And new modeling from BC today shows just how those types of restrictions can pay off. Health officials say the province is starting to flatten the curve once again. What we saw tipping the balance a few weeks ago was when we took measures to try and reduce those environments where people can inadvertently spread it to large numbers. So closing of the banquet halls, closing of nightclubs. Dr. Henry said the rate of growth for active cases has begun to drop, even though the number of new infections is still high. The province added four deaths and 358 new cases over the weekend. So restraint can work when people pay attention to distancing, the curve subsides. But some worry it's too late in Canada's hotspots. Alison Northcott has Quebec's ambitious new crackdown and the people who say this should have come sooner. Not everyone follows it. 17-year-old Ethan Mackay says not all of his classmates follow public health rules, especially when school lets out. People are asked to, to stay in like the certain bubbles that you're assigned with in the classroom with the, the class that you're in, and people don't do that. In Quebec, more than 600 schools have at least one case of COVID-19. With the province determined to keep schools open, it's introduced more measures in so-called red zones, including mandatory masks in high school classrooms. I was diagnosed with ADHD, it's going to be very difficult to like focus on like the work when I'm messing with my mask. Some say this should have come sooner. We're up over a thousand cases per day here, so it's almost like the government is reactive. All the actions that we are taking today uh, could, could and should prevent the closing of schools. In order to have fewer kids in high schools at once, grades 10 and 11 will alternate days in class and at home. Things are slowly going out of control. It's, it's like the embers of a, of a flame. With cases rising, this infectious disease specialist says mandatory masks for all students could help, along with everyone adhering strictly to the rules. We have to think a little bit on the um, overzealous side when we're trying to implement um, measures to mitigate the second wave. And I do think that you know, having masks in school at all ages would be at this moment perhaps the most prudent thing to consider. Also in red zones, organized team sports are on hold and gyms will close. We're doing so much good for a client mentally and physically. It's kind of sad. The numbers from the past few days show that the situation is still critical. The Premier says the latest measures are necessary until at least the end of the month. He's also asking Quebecers to download the federal government's COVID alert application, something the province had resisted until now. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The coronavirus has been deadly for healthcare workers in Canada, and today a new report said that could have been avoided if only the hard-learned lessons from the SARS outbreak had been followed. Karen Pauls explains. It's really scary. Like, I could die just because I'm going to work. Fresh off a shift at a Winnipeg long-term care home, this nurse says staff burnout is high, know, the proper PPE wet. can be yes, scarce, totally. and she's worried about what a second wave will bring for herself and her patients. If I go out into the community and I get COVID, I'm going to go to work and I know I'm going to kill... I'm going to kill people that I love. Her concerns are echoed in a wide-ranging report written by a senior advisor to a two-year commission on SARS. A precautionary approach says that uh, 
you know, where there is uncertainty, you act on the side of safety. And that's, that's at the center of looking after uh, health care workers. At the end of July, health care workers accounted for almost one in five COVID-19 infections. The official number of deaths is 12, although union sources put it at 16. This expert says Canada failed to clarify who is responsible for protecting health care workers. To make sure that they have the PPE that they need to do their job, to make sure that they have extended health benefits and psychological support. The muddiness over whose job it is is really something that needs to get sorted out. Dr. Teresa Tam acknowledges pandemic preparedness should be more inclusive. It has to extend to long-term care. People may be health workers who are doing home care and, you know, uh, seniors, residences. Karina Hayai agrees. We are the backbone of, peop of, of the rest of society's health care. And if you break us, you're breaking yourself in the long run. As the second wave is hitting parts of Canada, she and experts worry the lessons of SARS will still be ignored. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Starting today, Canadians can apply for two new federal benefits to help get through the pandemic. There is a sick leave benefit of up to $1,000 for two weeks for those who don't have existing coverage. And there's a caregiver benefit, $500 a week for up to 26 weeks. That's if you have to leave work to care for a dependent because of the pandemic. These replace the popular CERB payments that helped almost 9 million Canadians. And a landmark achievement in global health was celebrated today. Virologist Michael Houghton, Harvey Alter and Charles Rice won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. Houghton has called Alberta home for about a decade. Carolyn Dunn has the story. Dr. Michael Houghton first started looking for the hepatitis C virus in 1982. It took seven years for him to find the nucleic acid that would open the field of viral hepatitis research. Inspired more by his hero Louis Pasteur than the idea of winning a Nobel Prize. There's nothing more prestigious to a scientist than the Nobel, so it, it, it's very nice. As nice as it is, what counts for me more is that we've been able to prevent millions of infections. The Nobel Committee says that discovery has saved millions of lives and is expected to save millions more. Globally, race hopes that a hepatitis C virus can be controlled and eventually eliminated. Houghton's discovery led to hep C being virtually eliminated from donated blood supply in the early 90s. Transmission from blood transfusions fell by 80% in just a few years. But that was just the beginning, as Dr. Teresa Tam noted in her own shout out to Dr. Houghton. And of course, the discovery of this virus is extremely important now for the discovery on treatments and other ways of managing hepatitis C. Houghton's work laid the foundation for the development of drugs to cure hep C, the very first cure for any chronic viral illness. Today, 95% of patients with hep C can be cured. Houghton's colleagues and friends at the Li Ka Shing Institute are celebrating. He's very persistent and he's passionate about his work. He wants to do research that benefits patients. So what does a Nobel Prize winner do when the rush of accolades slow? Well, back to work, of course. Dr. Houghton's team of young Canadian scientists is manufacturing a hep C vaccine for global clinical trials next year. We're up to our necks in that right now. A vaccine could be publicly available in the next six or seven years. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. The federal government reintroduced legislation on medically assisted dying today in a push to get the bill passed before a court-imposed deadline. Canadians expect us to do this quickly. It's up to our parliamentary partners to work with us to get this passed. The new bill seeks to make it easier for people to pursue a medically assisted death. No longer would they have to demonstrate that their illness would result in a reasonably foreseeable death. The bill must pass in both the House and Senate by December 18th. Ottawa is also bringing back a controversial lottery system aimed at distributing coveted sponsorships to reunite immigrant families. Immigration Minister Marco Mendocino says starting next Tuesday, applicants will have three weeks to submit an online form to express their interest. There are only 
10,000 spots available. The program was delayed because of the pandemic. And CBC News has learned that a deal to sell the Come By Chance oil refinery in Newfoundland and Labrador has collapsed. Workers received notice from North Atlantic Refining today. The facility had seen an upswing prior to the pandemic, but was forced to stop refining fuels in March. Some 500 jobs could be directly affected. International calls for a ceasefire seem to be going unheard by Azerbaijan and Armenia. But the sounds of rocket fire and explosions are loud and clear. And as Chris Brown tells us, each side blames the other for an escalation over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh. The little village of Talish is now a trophy for Azerbaijan's army. Until yesterday, it was a home of ethnic Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, near the front lines of what's become a full-blown war. Militarily, Azerbaijan appears to have the upper hand, firing repeatedly at what it claimed were military targets in the disputed territory's capital of Stepanakert. But Armenia says only civilians were hit, and it struck back at Azerbaijan cities, some 60 kilometers from the front lines. In Moscow, we spoke to prominent Azerbaijani community leader Shamil Tagiev. I'd like to convince my Canadian friends that Azerbaijan is not the aggressor, but the victim, he said, because for more than 30 years, the land of Azerbaijan has been recognized by all international organizations that it is occupied. While Azerbaijan has spent years bolstering its military and waiting for the right moment to strike, it's Turkey that's tipped the balance by providing key military and political support. Armenia claims videos such as this show Turkey bringing in militants from Syria to fight against them. What we're witnessing right now is an existential moment. Renowned filmmaker and Armenian-Canadian Atta Magoyan has written to the Prime Minister saying he and other prominent Canadians fear genocide and ethnic cleansing. If Azerbaijan prevails, they want Ottawa to push Turkey to get out of the conflict. There's been a huge toll already in civilian deaths and injuries. Canada has to react to that and say that this is not acceptable uh, from a NATO ally. Today, Ottawa responded in part by suspending permits for military exports to Turkey that could include Canadian-made targeting sensors for Turkish drones until it's clear how they're being used. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. With COVID-19 cases on the rise, Canadians living alone are wondering what the next few weeks could look like. The thought of not being with other people for an extended period of time um, or an indefinite amount of time is, is overwhelming. Up next, what the second wave means for your single bubble. Plus, getting out the American vote in Canada. What's on the ballot for me this time around is voting for women's rights, black rights, gay rights. How eligible voters on this side of the border could shift the results. And later, one family's journey through a pandemic to their new home. They said they had a great view of the country, looking at the sea and the trees and so much greenery. We're back in two minutes. As COVID cases surge, public health officials in central Canada are asking residents in hot zones to limit contact with anyone outside their households. But those living alone are wondering, where does that leave them? Nicole Ireland explains. Stephanie Belding's daily walks have helped her get through the last seven months of COVID-19. I'm on my own, so it's me with a cat. Uh, there's been lots of baking and crafting and reading. But a key part of her well-being has been the bubble she formed with another single neighbor in her building. I cook a lot so we can share meals or we'll, we'll watch stuff together. And it gives them a sense of normalcy. Just knowing that I have someone in my immediate vicinity that I can kind of have a relationship with that isn't six feet away and, and masked. But as the number of COVID-19 cases climbs, health officials in Ontario say the concept of social circles or social bubbles has burst. They're asking people to limit contact with anyone outside their households, an alarming prospect for those who already went through the spring lockdown on their own. When you live alone, you know, when you, when you say a household and you're, you're the household, um, the thought of not being with other people for an extended period of time 
um, or an indefinite amount of time is, is overwhelming. According to Statistics Canada, more than a quarter of Canadians live alone. The percentage of single-person households jumped significantly in Toronto, Vancouver and Montreal. There's been a lot of attention on the enormous stress the pandemic has inflicted on families, but it's important to remember the effect on singles, says the psychology professor. Um, and, and I think that reality of a person who's trying to go through this by themselves um, is, is a very important one. The Quebec government has thought about that. Although it too is asking people to stay home in hotspots like Montreal, its COVID webpage recommends that people living alone choose one consistent visitor. The same strategy that's helped Stephanie Belding to feel much less alone. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Coronavirus restrictions in New Zealand's largest city will be lifted this week as the country declares it has once again beaten the virus. Auckland had gone into lockdown after a new cluster emerged in August, but it's now gone 12 days with no new cases. The city will now join the rest of the country on level one restrictions. That's the lowest rating on the government's virus alert system. When we come back, a closer look at tonight's top story. What Donald Trump returning to the White House tells us about his condition and what might be next. The doctors take on the unanswered questions. This was the scene not long ago this evening. The president walking out of Walter Reed Military Hospital just days after being admitted for a COVID infection. Now, though, his doctors say he has met or exceeded the criteria to be discharged. But all this comes with a warning. He may not entirely be out of the woods yet. With the next few days crucial for his recovery. There are still many questions and concerns about his condition and what happens next. And so to try to get some answers, we're joined now by Dr. Ali Khan. He's a former assistant U.S. Surgeon General, currently a dean at the College of Public Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, along with infectious disease specialist Dr. Susie Hoda from Toronto. So Dr. Khan, if we can start with you, what was your gut reaction when you learned that the president was being released from hospital just days after this public COVID diagnosis and then knowing about the symptoms he's been suffering and the treatments he's been undergoing? Oh, thank you very much, Adrian. So um, the, the treatment he's undertaken suggests that he had at least moderate disease if he was put on this steroid medication. But I'd like to remind people that there are people with mild to moderate disease that have stayed at home. So it's not unusual that if somebody feels well with COVID, they would be at home. Uh, the only interesting feature to him is he needs to undergo 10 days of isolation like anybody else with COVID. So I guess the CDC could slap an isolation order uh, on the president. I'd like to see them try to do that. Uh, Dr. Hoda, what concerns do you have both for the president, and as Dr. Khan was just mentioning, you know, those around him, because the White House staffers who have continued really to test positive since his diagnosis. Right. I mean, I think like anybody else who's gotten a diagnosis of COVID-19, my main concern for the president is his health and his well-being. And I certainly hope that he is, uh, you know, going to have a smooth recovery while in isolation uh, and that he doesn't suffer any side effects from any of the treatments he, he may have received as well. Um, in terms of those around him in the White House, I mean, I, I think it's a great example of how important it is um, to be maintaining physical distancing and, and trying to wear your mask as well within these indoor settings. And you can see how rapidly it can spread within these closed quarters that people have, have worked together in uh, very closely. So a good reminder of how important that is for them to be looking forward to. And, and also uh, the contact tracing that's going to be required mm -hmm. to try and be that you can get a hold of or a handle on onward transmission is, is a really important thing that I hope they're, they're working very hard on. So certainly there's the very serious task of, of the logistics of sorting this, as you just mentioned. But Dr. Hoda, in terms of medically, what might the next few days look like for President Trump, given, given what we know about the sort of the timeline of COVID-19 in the body? Well, you know, we're getting close to the one week point mm -hmm. from the initial diagnosis. And, and this is a critical period because 
you know, this is when people will either really kind of step down to having milder disease and be on that road to recovery or may deteriorate. And in 20% of cases, people will require a hospitalization because they develop more severe symptoms of the disease for consequences of the disease. Um, and then another 15% of that group would then go on to requiring critical care level of treatment. So, you know, I think watching closely for uh, sometimes people start to feel a lot better and then have, have a deterioration, you know, it's, it can be a bit of a bimodal um, um, course. Um, the other thing is with these therapeutics on board, making sure that there aren't any adverse events related to that, um, because some of these, of course, are, are experimental with this uh, illness and, and making sure that those symptoms are monitored very, very closely too. Uh, this is relentless, this virus. Uh, Dr. Khan, I, I'm curious about your expertise on this, because in terms of the relationship between the president and his doctors, what's the possibility that that medical advice is not entirely being followed, or what kind of pressure might the president's medical team really be under in this moment? I assume significant pressure, since mm -hmm. this is the president of the United States, but even if you take the president out of it, these are usual tensions between patients and their doctors, and you know, I've had patients who've signed out against medical advice in the past. I think he's fortunate to have some of the best doctors in the world who will be monitoring him, whether it's at Walter Reed or whether it's at the medical unit uh, at the White House to make sure that he doesn't have any side effects from his current medications and his disease doesn't progress. And we wish him the best that this disease doesn't progress and he does recover uneventfully, uh, recognizing that there's a lot of unknowns about what happens even with mild infections in people to their heart, to their lungs, and to their brain. And so, last question to both of you, very briefly. Hours before he was released from the hospital, the president tweeted, don't be afraid of COVID. And I'm wondering what your reaction is to him saying that. Start with you, Dr. Hoda. Well, you know, maybe we don't need to be afraid of it because that can be a, you know, an unhelpful response. But we certainly need to have a healthy dose of respect for what this disease can do to people. Um, you know, over a million people have died from this, uh, and and certainly a, a lot more have actually had very serious consequences from it, and sometimes long-standing consequences from it. So, you know, I I hope that this isn't being seen as a, a way to to minimize the impact of it, uh, and just you know, trying to get people to not fear it is not a bad. Thing, but let's respect it. Last thought to you, Dr. Khan. We have had a failed public health response in the United States, and hopefully the president's experience now will help him think about how do we decrease community transmission in the United States and drive our deaths down to zero. All right, Dr. Khan, Dr. Hoda, as always, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. After the break, what a close U.S. election means for Americans living in Canada. Is going to win by one vote. Maybe he'll win by one vote. Maybe that one vote will be mine. We look at the stakes on both sides of the aisle for voters in this country. And a Canadian story goes to the big screen why Saskatchewan farmers are worried about what Hollywood got wrong. Welcome back. There is a huge opportunity in Canada to make a real impact in next month's presidential election. More eligible American voters live here than in any other country outside the U.S. So the push is on by both parties to get those ballots in. And as Nick Purden found for many, it's not just about politics. It is, of course, personal. I'm passionate about this election because I feel that there are a lot of people that are seeing the negative effects of the current person in power. We can't sit back anymore. Heather Peterson is an American living in St. Catharines, Ontario. Just three months ago, she helped create a brand new chapter of something called Democrats Abroad Canada. Her goal? Get as many of the 600,000 Americans on this side of the border to vote for Joe Biden. What's on the ballot for me this time around is voting for women's rights, black rights, gay rights. I'm just seeing this dark cloud over everything. I wish that there was something brighter in the world again. Another four years of the current government in the United States, what would that mean to you? I don't want to think about it. What do you mean? What do I mean? I just can't. I, I'm so broken that I can't. I just have a fear that if it continues down this path, that we won't be able to undo it anymore. There's no denying Heather's passion, but will she convince more people to vote? 
Could the votes cast in Canada actually swing the U.S. election? In the history of elections, you know, we've always heard this is the most critical, this is the most critical. This is the most critical. American democracy is on the ballot this time around. Meet Steve Nardi. He's the chair of Democrats Abroad Canada. And he tells me that four years ago, around 30,000 votes in total were cast from Canada. He's working to double that. With 35 days out from the election, my life is heads down focused on this game. Steve is so committed to winning this election because it's become personal for him. What's at stake for you? <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. There's a lot of issues there for me because um, I'm the only Democrat in my family. What's at stake for me? Tell me what you're thinking about, what, you, what you're feeling. My family. Your family. Because it's been pretty contentious. I mean, I called my father and all I said was, what concerns me is the unbottling of hate that this person is, has seemed to have uncorked. Trump. Yes and he yelled at me for 20 minutes. That breaks my heart. Steve is cautiously optimistic that he'll get the win he wants so badly. But let's not forget there are two horses in this race. Who are you voting for and, and where? Well, that's a secret ballot, but um, I vote in California. And um, well, I guess you will leave it to you to figure out who I voted for. Mark Feigenbaum is the chairman of Republicans Overseas. He admits they aren't doing as much in Canada to get out the vote as the Democrats, but he's not that worried. The really? Democrats are really motivated because they have a fear that people aren't going to vote. They're coming up from behind at this point and, and trying to, to, to win this election. And so while you're asking why they're all so very active, that almost is a, 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 in itself an admission that they have a lot of work to do to win this thing. The Democrats think they can make a difference in battleground states in this election with Americans voting in Canada. Do you agree? I think that they're trying, but there's so many Republicans everywhere that, that are going to vote that want uh, the current government, that, that as much as they try, it, it, they're going to fall short. But not every Republican in Canada is that confident. Meet George Ann Burke. It does worry me that Republicans are less active in Canada. It worries me a lot. I am actually an unabashed supporter of Donald Trump. George Ann knows how close this race is, especially in swing states like Florida. I'm hoping that my vote in Florida um, actually is, I, I don't know, is he going to win by one vote? Maybe he'll win by one vote. Maybe that one vote will be mine. I'm just fearful that if the Democrats are in power, they will undo all of the good things. And there are many good things that Donald Trump has done over the four years. Um, I think they will undo them. I think they will hurt the economy. I think they will continue to divide the country. So I am extremely worried. This is, without a question for me, the single most important election of my lifetime. And on that point, Republicans and Democrats agree. It's the most important election for Heather, too. What are you holding and what does it mean to you? This is my vote for this year's election. It means, it means change. Nick Purden, CBC News, St. Catharines, Ontario. Still ahead, why movie productions are moving east. We are currently the safest place, I would say, certainly in Canada, if not the world, to be trying to do something like this. The Atlantic region's latest win, all thanks to the pandemic. I'm Josh Block. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, one woman's story of losing her mother to COVID-19 in a long-term care center, and why she thinks nothing has changed. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Most Canadian farmers don't get their stories told by Hollywood, but a film about Percy Schmeiser's legal battle with seed giant Monsanto hits the big screen Friday. As Bonnie Allen tells us, some worry it will be less fact, more fiction. Who are those men, Grandpa? Monsanto will say that all of this is their property. Guess we're going to court then. The director calls this the true story of Saskatchewan farmer Percy Schmeiser. But when the first poster showed actor Christopher Walken in a field of corn, prairie farmers got nervous. The entire story is about canola. Percy Schmeiser's son gives the movie two thumbs up. It's very accurate. And really at the end of the day, you know, their story is 
is about defending themselves. In the late 90s, Monsanto found its genetically modified canola in Schmeiser's field. He never paid for the right to grow it, so Monsanto sued. Monsanto's claiming the canola you grew in 97 contained a technology in the seeds gene that they created. Schmeiser maintains that seeds blew into his field in the wind. He argued that he owned them, but the Supreme Court ruled he knowingly violated Monsanto's patent. It was very stressful. It's our community and we divided farmers. I hope the audience really connects to the idea of this guy putting everything on the line for what he felt was right and true. The movie leaves out some key facts. The judge dismissed Schmeiser's explanation as unrealistic, and so did many of his neighbors and scientists. Front page of the Washington Post. The movie also celebrates Schmeiser as a poster boy for opponents of genetically modified plants. Canola farmers are bracing themselves. Is that what the what the uh, bent of this movie is going to be? Is it, is it going to be all about anti-GMO? Anti it's great for Hollywood, but um, it, it's not great for agriculture. Newspaper editor Mike Rain says the movie's anti-GMO message amounts to fear-mongering. That, that's dangerous. GM uh, is good science, uh, it's good agriculture, the economics are right and it helps feed the world. This case was divisive then, and no doubt still today, as this movie version stirs it all up again. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Canada's film industry has been hit hard by this pandemic, but some provinces are enjoying a recent boom in production, especially in the Atlantic bubble, where infections are relatively low. Kayla Hounsell looks at the impact. This is the set of a Stephen King horror series, but technicians say working here isn't scary at all. Oh my God, I totally feel safe. I mean, Patrick I'm Doyle really says since the show got up and running seven weeks ago, he's been tested for COVID 17 times. He says strict measures combined with few cases make production possible. We are currently the safest place, I would say, certainly in Canada, if not the world, to be trying to do something like this. The whole Atlantic region and others are taking notice. We're seeing, you know, a huge uptake in interest from, uh, from uh, below the border. Screen Nova Scotia says it expects that interest to translate into actual projects. For the most part, um, we don't see our, uh, our production season extend well into the, into the winter. And this year I expect that we will. And I also expect that we'll see a full season beginning early next year as well. Action! People who work in the industry say the Atlantic bubble, which allows travel freely within the region but requires anyone coming from outside to isolate, does make things more costly for film studios. They have to pay actors to sit in hotel rooms for two weeks, and in this case, they've also hired extra people for COVID control. We remind people if they have their mask down, we tell them to put it on. Um, if they're too close to people, we make sure they social distance. Uh, if we see people forming into large groups, um, we tell them to separate. Most productions opt for local crews, but there might not be enough of them to keep up with demand if the boom continues. Doyle says he hopes it will. And a production can leave here and the product is quality, the experience has been quality, and you felt safe. I think that sells the province better than anything else. Cut it there. Thank you very That's much. Cut. He's optimistic that could create work long after the final scene has been shot. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Middle Sackville, Nova Scotia. Next on The National, a Syrian family comes to Canada in the middle of a pandemic. Their journey to a new home is our moment. Next. This family of Syrian refugees took a very long journey in the middle of a pandemic to a new life in Haida Gwaii. The very last leg, a flight in a seaplane over the stunning BC coast. Their trip home to this new home is our moment. We started our application two years ago. Around uh, September, we received an email confirming that they will fly after all. When we look at how we have to minimize the contact um, for the family and the public, charter plane is the only way to do it. Ezra spoke with me before she flew. I tried to explain to her uh, with, with Arabic translated through Google Translate. And when I explain seaplane, she has n absolutely no idea what seaplane looks like and what it means. So I, all I could tell her was, it's a very, very small plane. It will only accommodate all of you and your suitcases. 
but treat this like a, uh, a special flight, like at, at, at an amusement park. You know, that's all I could try to explain to her. And all she did when they came off the uh, seaplane, they were all thankful. They were, they kept saying, thank you, thank you. And they enjoyed the flight. They said they had a great view of the country, looking at the sea and the trees and so much greenery all over the place. And they're absolutely happy. So imagine it from Aleppo to Lebanon to Haida Gwaii, uh, Mustafa and Isra and the kids uh, were greeted there by people who uh, made enough food for their 14-day isolation. That is a national for October 5th. Good night.